Oh, 80 catches for 800 yards? Or 793 yards on 63 receptions. I oh, thought it was 83. Oh, sorry. like 80 targets? Okay. Yeah. 63 receptions. Either way, not much not much of a number one receiver. Preston Smith, he was undrafted, and he had the whole domestic violence situation. Um, but let's not act like that was a great offense because they got clapped by the Bills. So I think that's the point about Tua, though. That's what I'm that's saying. That's more their offense. That's not just Tua. They didn't have a thousand yard running back this year. They have a thousand yard receiver this year. Like you gotta like not put all that on Tua. You gotta say we need a receiver. We got a left tackle in the draft. Uh, you know we got we got some help. We got free agents. We got a defense. But we need to build this offense out more. So I think you give two in one more year. I think it's too early. But if you really want to pull the trigger and get Deshaun Watson, shut up and do it. But don't keep having these reports come out because that's wrong. And you're just going to literally just nerf yourself. But, yeah, Lawrence is probably going to be the first pick. But, anyway, next topic. All right, going around the rest of the – uh. What do you want to call it? Coaching carousel. Um, the Jets hire Robert Sella as their new head coach, former defensive coordinator with the 49ers. I know he was also interviewing with the Chargers. But, yeah, the fucking Jets went defensive again. What's wrong with them? Didn't work out the last two, three times. I thought Adam Gase was an offensive head coach. Oh, yeah, he was. I forgot. His was offense was so terrible. That he became defensive. Yeah, uh, it's kind of pathetic um, that they kind of, I feel like they rushed this. Why? Yeah, why did they rush it so fast? You could have waited. Like, you, no one was, like, trying to get solid that bad. The enemy would have been a better choice long term, but I don't think he would have even wanted that gig. I think they just wanted somebody, and they didn't want to well, wait. Well, the enemy's waiting for the perfect gig, he said, and also... You can't interview him until the Super Bowl, the week before the Super Bowl. Yeah. Well, that's another two weeks. And that's where he plans to be. At the wait. I wouldn't be surprised if Andy Reid retires and they just hand the reins to him. I think that would be dope. But that rarely ever happens. I think I read a tweet somewhere that there are like four coaches right now in the Andy Reid. Tree that are all successful? Yeah. No, that are in the playoffs still. McDermott. Like four of them started. McDermott the is one of them. Uh, Harbaugh. Let me see. I think I retweeted it. Yeah, it's it's McDermott, Harbaugh. I forget the other two, but history successful. Bill Belichick's coaching tree, uh, not so much. Mangini's on TV. Rex Ryan, I think, gained some of that way back from the lap band. <laughs> and like when when Rex Ryan is saying. Houston, don't be stupid and trade Deshaun Watson, too. Don't triple down on your stupidity. You already traded Hopkins. Don't trade Watson, too. When Rex Ryan has to talk sense into you from an offensive standpoint, that's a problem. Because the third one is Kevin Stefanski. There we go. Coaching tree is pretty solid. And they're usually all offensive-minded. I mean, they have their, their, you know, like some are defense. Uh, Harbaugh was a special teams coach. But, man, it just really makes no sense that, like, Belichick's coaching tree is this terrible. As great as Andy Reid's coaching tree is, it's like, damn. Well, Reed? it's not really fair. I feel it's like it's fair. No, it's fair. No, nah, it's not really fair to me because okay. like a lot of the West Coast coaches all like came up together. From Bill Walsh. So they're all in the same fucking coaching tree. Like the Home Green coaching tree and the fucking Reed coaching tree and the Gruden coaching tree are all like one fucking big ass. That's the Packers. One big ass fucking shrub. And who's one, that? One fucking grove. So we're the West Coast and New York couldn't hold their shit together? Because Belichick is like the East Coast coaching tree. They're the, they're the New York hip-hop scene. They cannibalize themselves. Like, what's his name? Uh, Miami head coach. 
He's actually going to be the um, – Brian Flores is going to be one of the head coaches in the Senior Bowl. Like, that's uh, the only successful coach right now from Belichick's tree. Mangini beat him a couple of times, but other than that, Mangini never did anything with the Jets. And I'm not even going to say he who's – Bill O'Brien? I'm not even going to say his name or the other guy's Bob. name. Bob? Who got fired? Was going from, to Alabama? I'm not going to say the other guy's name. Who got fired by the Lions recently? What's up with Alabama taking? It's uh, smart. Offensive it's coordinators. Very smart. Is it a recruiting tactic or what? no? They take failed head coaches in the NFL, and they were good coaches at one point. I mean, Penn State was whatever, but they were good coaches at one point, and you just burn that NFL mentality into your players. Hmm. That's why they have this resurgence at Alabama. Mm. It's like you're playing Madden, right? And you're which is a perfect segue to the thing we've been alluding to for a little bit. Um, Interesting. the the wild The wild card playoff happened this week. Uh, if you're watching it, Rams fans out there, you know the Rams beat the Seahawks in what was a really fucking ugly ass game. Surprisingly, like considering those two teams, like you said. They always beat the shit out of each other, yes. But those two teams have two of the most well-respected coaches. And what I took away from that game, having watched it, was, surprisingly enough, the Rams look like the better coach team. Which poses the question, is Seattle making the mistake by bringing back Pete Carroll, who, yes, is the second oldest head coach? Imagine if Pete Carroll just said, fuck it, I'm going to go back to USC. I'm, dog, get I that would, fantasy out of your I head. I would dog. scream. Oh, happy get day. the get the fantasy out of your head. Fun fact: He actually isn't eligible to be in the College Football Hall of Fame. Damn! But Carson Palmer got it. It's crazy. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> but who are you going to replace him with? That's what I was saying. If Urban Meyer went to Seattle, I'd be like, this could be interesting. That's what I'm saying is, is there somebody better you're going to get? And I'm pretty sure the enemy a would be the teams. only person. I'm pretty sure Pete Carroll could have any of these open positions that he wanted. Mm. But none of them are better than Seattle. Why so would he want to go to Houston? Point? That's what I'm saying. None of them are better than Seattle. No, just why would he want to go to Houston, period? They're a cancers. That's what I'm saying. You. All the They're open organizations. Franchise. All the open organizations are places you wouldn't want to be. Except nah. for maybe the Chargers. No, nah, the Chargers, the Chargers are perfect have their location. own. Their the own. Chargers are better. Chargers have their own problems. They have, Their problems are not the roster, but everything else around Luck, it. Ex- losses of ex-girlfriends past. Bottom line is, the Chargers is the best job in football right now. So, and the reason why I brought up Pete Carroll and, and the connections to USC, which you keep making, was I was listening everywhere. to Petros this week, and he brought up this point of it's kind of like the end of USC where it's like, yeah, he's still good, but it's not the same. And he was saying he he made the point of the biggest difference is his assistant coaches. Yeah, like he started off at USC with really strong assistant coaches, coordinators, and then slowly but surely he just kind of put in yes men. Rocky Seto became a pastor, if I'm not mistaken. And and he brought up the same point with Seattle. It's like now he has Ken Norton Jr., which you know, he's back? lining up. No, he's been the defensive coordinator for three years. Really? I thought yeah, he, since I he thought left he the Raiders. Was, I thought he was a linebacker coach again. Or two years, yeah. He's been the defensive coordinator for like two years now. I thought they had somebody else. No, nah, he's the defensive coordinator there. Well, they also haven't drafted well, and they but, couldn't resign Clowney. But yeah, so and that's the other point of it, too, is the GM head coaching thing rarely works out, which I think they actually took away his GM power and are looking for somebody to help with personnel. Um, they but yeah, yeah, yeah. GM. So they have Ken Norton Jr. They let go of Brian Schottenheimer. But he was another yes man, and so they're just saying like, I mean, even where Schottenheimer's yes been, he's been an underwhelming offensive coordinator. Exactly, he got in the game because of his dad. Exactly, and that's that's the point. It's he's like been maybe, vanilla everywhere he's gone. Maybe, maybe Pete. Maybe it's just it's done. The line, the line is just running out. It's just is it running out for Belichick too? Mm, well, this is his, maybe. Uh, Maybe. Maybe that, that old guard of coaches are just about, except for Andy Reid, who made the ultimate sacrifice. He took losses for years. 
just losing season, almost being there. But he had been to, really he had, close. He had to really go close. somewhere else and reinvent himself because that. I mean, that's a good comparison in terms of where he was at when Philly, towards the end of the Philly run, it Philly was like, could like have run he wasn't he wasn't a bad coach. They weren't a terrible team. They couldn't get over the hump. But they couldn't get over the hump. And the stench of McNabb and Kevin Cobb. And that's kind of what's I going mean, on in Seattle. They still have that stench of the Legion of Boom, but they're far from that. No, they have the stench of Pete Carroll's. Like, eventually people get tired of the rah-rah. It just goes one ear and not the other. And if there's not strong enough leadership in that locker room, like, yeah, Adams had nine and a half sacks. That's great. And apparently he got surgery on both his shoulders and both his hands. Uh, and that's great. But, like, where's the accountability from that defense? That I defense think it's, is terrible. It's, it's more than just the rah-rah. I think it's like you get tired of looking over your shoulder every week on compete Wednesdays. Like, damn, who's going to take my job? And cats out here getting hurt every week and, and not going into games at full strength because or it's corny. that's the culture. Or if the message is, like, just corny and drawn out. Because players are always going to play. But the motivation is different. Like, you look at, let's say, Ohio State when Urban Meyer left and when Ryan Day came in and they were beating the shit out of everybody. What changed? The message? The person? The The mentality? The energy? The messenger. There you go. The message was still the same. The messenger just handled it a little bit differently. You look at what happened with, you know, Seattle. They've had a bad defense for years. They've had a bad offensive line for years. They got by on gritty defense, running the ball, and Russell Wilson, who's honestly probably the most underrated player in the NFL this decade. Easily the most underappreciated. Because if you put him in Green Bay... He'd be on par with Aaron Rodgers. And that's why you need coaches who can challenge you underneath you and say, no, coach, I need this guy. I don't want that guy. Or, no, coach, we need this type of player. Or, no, coach, we need to make this call. You know, and and I think you could see when you watch that Seattle team, and I watched them at various points in the season. I don't watch every game, but I watched them, you know, the beginning of the season. This last game, I watched a couple games in the middle of the season. So I've seen their progression, and you could just tell that it was a good team, but they lacked an identity outside of Russell Wilson. It was like one week. going to save us. One week, it was Russ is going to save us. Let's throw over the top DK. Let's throw over the top to Lockie. And then the next week, it's like, fuck, let's run the ball with our four running backs. And it's like, yeah, you want to be balanced, and yeah, you want to have multiple weapons. But at the end of the day, if you don't have an identity or a starting point, then you're really just desperate. Like the Raiders. I would rather talk about the Chargers all day than the Raiders for five minutes. Because it's not a point of they don't know what the problem is. They know what the problem is and they're not doing anything. It's a structural thing. Like, with the Raiders like they keep just it's insanity doing the same thing over and over again expecting a different result that's the Raiders the Chargers are like we just have bad shitty luck but we you see what we're building and they're like right there they're so close they just need somebody who will flip that switch like Carol did when he went to Seattle and the switch flipped with when they brought in Marshawn Lynch and then they became, like, a threat as a team. So, like, when the Patriots got Corey Dillon. You know, when the Ra- when the Patriots got Randy Moss. Like, there's a player that s- flips the switch for you as a franchise and elevates you to, a, like, okay, we got to get this done now. The same way I look at Nick Chubb, the way he changed the Cleveland Browns franchise. It wasn't really Baker. It wasn't really Landry. Landry was a start. Odell's like, if if he can stay healthy, it'd be even more dangerous. But Nick Chubb was the backbone of that offense. And then you bring in a Stefanski who knows how to...